Hello, this is Kingston Live. It's John here. Rob is with me. Hello, Rob. Hello, John. And I want to give just a little bit of context for anybody who's been following us over our podcasting journey. Last month, we talked to Ricky and Jonas and Kira, and everybody was very optimistic and enthusiastic about live music coming back. And here we are a month later, and Kingston is the worst place in the entire country for COVID right now, unfortunately. So it's been a little discouraging, but uh, the fortunate thing is there is no shortage of interesting people to speak to in Kingston about the local music scene, whether it's happening or not. And we have <laughs> two of those people with us. I want to thank Stephen Hyten for joining us. Hello, Steve. Hey, thanks for having me on. And Hugh Christopher Brown, also known as simply Chris Brown. Hi, so good to be here. Thank you for joining us. So uh, I want to start with just kind of a general sort of thing here. Uh, Kingston is an interesting place because I think there are a lot of people, a lot of people are born here and some people choose to be here. And I know the two of you are from Toronto. Steve, I know you've spent some time in Asia. I know, Chris, you've been in New York, uh, but you both call the area home. What, what is it about Kingston that, that sort of keeps you here? You first, Stephen, because you've been here longest. Right. Okay. Well, I, I actually came here first in 81 to go to University of Queens and then traveled, uh, worked uh, for a while in Asia, a couple of years, and taught English in Japan. And when I came back in, I guess it was over 30 years ago, I knew I wanted to make a life as a writer. And I thought, what's a good place to do that? I knew that other cities were expensive. I knew Kingston, I knew it was fairly cheap. Like it was very cheap at that. It's no longer cheap, in fact, <laughs> but it was very cheap at that time. I could get a room for 300 bucks. And I just knew this, I sensed this would be a good place to make a life as a writer. Uh, I knew there was enough things going on here, like live music, for example, even then, uh, you know, fairly good scene then, not as good as now, um, not counting COVID. But there were a lot of reasons that I thought this would be an interesting enough city. It would be stimulating but not overwhelming the way Toronto or Montreal would have been, or New York, for example. I would have just been going to events all the time, meeting people. Uh, and I think it was a good choice. Uh, choice. It's been a good place to make a life as a writer for over 30 years now. Yeah, my, my relationship to the city has been entirely musical. Um, you know, w when we were kids, we had the Bourbon Tabernacle Choir that started touring when we were in our late teens. And Kingston was one of the places that uh, we first really got, you know, able to play bigger and bigger shows. Um, and, and, uh, then you, you, years later, like after having lived in New York for, um, about 15 years, I came up to Wolf Island for a hockey tournament and in all the years that I'd been playing in Kingston, everybody talked about the island, but I'd never been here. And so I had to come from the other side and, um, that night just, you know, played music until four in the morning here on the island. Um, and uh, met Sarah McDermott and she and I bought the old post office, which I made into a music studio. And, in, and initially with, so that I could work here. Um, but then it just, the island just kind of took over because it triangulates my hometown Toronto, where my mom is and family is with all my family in New York City. And it's this place of congregation. So it's just been, it's just it's been really it's it's just afforded, like Stephen said, affording him a life as, as a writer. It's been very conducive to my life in music unexpectedly. It wasn't planned, you know, um, but now uh, we bought the hotel on the island and made it into a music venue recording studio farmer's market, all that stuff, which we can get into, but it's just, it's just been a, I like, okay, <laughs> what's next? Hey, Chris, isn't that where I met you, that tournament? Was it 2010, 2011? Yeah, that sounds right. The Lake Ontario Cup, yeah. Oh, yeah, but I would have been there earlier. Um, I met you in 2010, but I, I mean, because, yeah, I, I would have been maybe like 2003 or four when I first came, you okay. know? Yeah. And, and you both call Wolf Island home now, is that right? 
I don't. I, I still live on the mainland, but I was I was coming across regularly to work with Chris when we were recording my album. And you know, I, I can't, I've come over a few times since we finished, but I'm hoping to go over a lot more once we're past this, if we're ever past this present uh, state. You know, we founded Kingston Live out of our own recognition that the city's music scene, including the many artists that write, record and perform here, was really, you know, something special. But Wolf Island is part of what makes it so special because I think, and I'm not the only one, I'm sure, that it seems like Wolf Island has its own scene going on, its own sort of microculture, maybe. And, and it's it's one that I would say simultaneously intrigues Kings, Kingstonians and maybe mystifies them a little bit too. But Chris Brown, what is it about Wolf Island that makes it that way? Well, um, uh, going back in, in a real, you know, a, a, a historic and spiritual sense, the thing about Manhattan that's amazing is that it's in this estuary and it's this confluence, it's this meeting place. It always has been, as we know, in, in human history. We all sit in the headwaters of the biggest estuary on the planet on Wolf Island. It's similarly a place of congregation for migratory species. And also before settlers came, this was always a place where people of different nations would, would come for you know, fishing, music, celebration. And when our partners at, at Lodgepole, like our, which is a Mohawk Arts Alliance that, that share the residents of the hotel with us, talked to us about that history, it just made sense. It's just like, as I said, the first night I was here, I played music until the wee hours of the morning. So it is, there's something about the confluence of the natural elements, um, and how people are drawn to to kind of congregate here. It's it's really um, it's it's really uncanny the similarities. I, it's it's actually similar in landmass, though different in shape to Man Manhattan. Huh. But population huh. twelve hundred. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it, However, um, th the fact that I'm sitting here in the hotel, which as I said is now a center for arts and agriculture and um, indigenous work. And, you know, it's, it's again, meeting all, all of these things. It's proximity to Kingston, needless to say, is incredibly special uh, and important and it allows us to do things like Stephen and I being able to make a record and, and just, it's, it, he's literally here in an hour. And it's, I can get to work in New York in five and a half hours from here. You know, I can get to you can get to Montreal or Toronto in two and a half hours. So it's like, it's it's yeah. There there's there's a whole geography to it. I would I could then expand in term, terms of culturally. We all know between Kingston and the Ottawa Valley what a rich and fertile place this is for music, and how those various strains influence one another, um, and. You know, I, I I would I would just augur that 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 the island is is somehow freed from the confines of any one of those definitions, and it, like Manhattan, it becomes its own thing. You know, um, it, it, it's uncanny to me. Stephen, what's your thoughts on that same topic? Sorry, John. I I, I wanted to know what uh, what's, what Stephen uh, maybe thought about that. I, you know, yeah. I hadn't thought about uh, Wolf Island being about the same size as the island of Manhattan, but you know, now that I think about, I guess it is. It's it you know it has you know one two thousandth of the population, but still it's a, it's amazing. And yeah, the, I I, can't, I hadn't really thought of it in, in terms of you know the the estuary, the wa various waters meeting there, um, but I think it's a great way to think of it, and and certainly I've always loved it, and I. I've never been sure whether that's just because it's kind of an escape from my life here. It's just a ferry ride across from the mainland, but it feels very rural. And Marysville, uh, the town where, where Chris lives and where the hotel is, is, is a village, really. Um, so it always feels like an escape to me. It feels like I'm on holiday a long way away. Uh, and that, as you know, just being away from your life, being away from dailiness, being away from email, those things are you know, extremely conducive to creativity, as we all know. So it, I think we're all finding it harder and harder to get to those places. So I was really happy to be going there once a week. I, I even came up with some ideas that turned into songs on the ferry rides back and forth 
Uh, because again, it's a kind of liminal space where you're crossing from one world to another, uh, to a world that feels very different for reasons Chris explained. And that's a great place to be creatively too, in that liminal space, that, that, that limbo between, between worlds. That's really cool. And you both touched on something that I wanted to ask you about. We've talked in this podcast before about environments and geography and how they influence creativity. And, and we've talked before about how there's a Kingston sound. And there's a lot of musicians who, who don't sound like Kingston, but there are a lot of artists who do sound like Kingston. And I'm curious, do you feel that Wolf Island has a sound? Does it have a vibe? Is there a different energy creatively there? Could, John, could I just cut in for one yeah. second, Chris? I just want to ask John to clarify um, before Chris answers, how would you qualify that sound? How would you characterize that sound? Uh, you said Kingston has a distinctive sound. That's a tough question, but I'm just curious. So I know <laughs> we're on the same page here. Yeah, well, that's that's a tough one. And, and that's a question we've sort of been asking ourselves from the start. And it's hard to define. Like, I think it's it's sort of a straight ahead rock kind of sound. But there's something else happening. And I think even when we talked to Nadia Pacey uh, a couple of years ago, she touched on it. There's there's like a mainstream rock vibe, but there's also like a little bit of weirdness in there. There's like <laughs> something that just twists it a little bit into some really kind of idiosyncratic esoteric kind of way it's it's very hard to define but if i'm gonna have to try to define it on the spot like this i think that's my response yeah okay thanks um i i would say you never recognize your own accent so it's it's easier for it's easier for me to look at how people have responded similarly when kate fenner and i were you know, it's so really starting to work in New York and people would say, oh, they would compare us to Canadian artists. And we're like, huh? And, and it's, and now it, you, I understand, oh, there was something to the space and the temperament of what we were doing, even though let's say we didn't sound or we're in the same idiom as other folks, it, it was there. So what's interesting to me is that the records that we've been making in, on Wolf Island, Stevens included, when they get reviewed, there are these similar things that are that are exposed and that are shown, you know. And and um, I remember when David Corley got a review in Uncut magazine over in in um, the UK. They, you know, they were saying, and it was made in an uh, in a in a, a abandoned post office in an island um, south of Ontario. I <laughs> think that's how they they described it, right? So there's like this. There's a kind of mystique, there's an islandness to it, which is always very interesting because you get miscreants and, and intention here at the same time, right? Um, and I, I just have to say that the records with all the different artists that we work with here, there is something common. And you, it's not that we're chasing it, it just happens. You know, it's poetic, there's space in it. When I listen to the records of the last decade from here, there is a temperament to it. There's space, there's space. That's how I would describe it, you know? Um, and they, they might cross different genres, um, but it's different. Like it's certainly different than the albums I make in New York. Um, and uh, it's heighteningly different than the music I made growing up in Toronto. But I mean, that's just part of it has to do with your where you're at as an artist. Um, so I, that might sound like a lot of information, but that really is how I answer the question. You know, I, I can't really define it. Someone else has to from the outside if, uh, in terms of what their experience is receiving it. I just feel it. I just know I trust what happens here implicitly. You know, as Stephen will tell you, like, you know, you're stabbing at the wood stove. You're going for walks. Maybe we're going for a skate. The bird sounds the animals that literally appear at the door end up on records, you know, <laughs> it, like literally. And so all of this, the fact that we allow that to happen means the music, it doesn't sound confined, defined, tight, oppressed. It's very, very open and del it's deliberate. Like if you listen to, and Stephen's, um, you know, example, like he's so deliberate with his language, right? I am as intentional with the, the, the choices, but it's just that you, they're allowed to occur here. Where in other places where there's different measurements and different cultures, they don't necessarily come forth, right? 
I would have found it pretty hard, I think, to make that first record in uh, an actual soundproof studio, conventional studio. I mean, the one thing, not only were we constantly feeding logs into Chris's wood stove, but there was um, Sarah McDermott's uh, dog, Bear, was present. So you're usually sitting on the floor at my feet when I was trying to get these vocals. And I was it was a very steep learning curve. I was learning about using a mic, learning about using my voice, not as a poet, but as a singer, which is very different uh, for all sorts of reasons. Um, but having that the dog there and Chris's uh, seven, eight cats, I, I, I lost count. Uh, they were like emotional. Why would you count cats? <laughs> They were like emotional support animals for yes. somebody who is a rookie uh, in middle age trying to learn how to do this. And it really helped. I would have found it harrowing, frankly, the first few times being in a regular studio. So it really helped being in this setting. Chris, you you founded Wolf Island Records and the post office studio with Sarah McDermott as, a, as an artist run label. Um, that label has become home to a stellar lineup of acts, including... Luther Wright, Stephen Stanley, The Gertrudes, Kate Fenner, Jukebox County, Clem Chesterfield, Gary Rasberry, Stephen Heighton now. Well, wow, you're good. I, I kind of feel like I know we've been, we've been following pretty closely. We, um, and I think the reason is, is because I almost feel like you know, Wolf Island Records is this really super cool club with its own clubhouse and, uh, you know, like a <laughs> league of extraordinary musicians or something. And I wanted to know if you can tell us a little bit about the driving ethos behind Wolf Island Records. Um, so what was interesting is, is that, okay, so the post office was bought. There was no running water. I went two years working on a wood stove and rain barrels. And the first people to make a record in there were the mermaids from New York City. And it wasn't planned, but guess what? the sound of crunching snow ended up on the record <laughs> and you know just again the whole kind of ethos of it was kind of mystical so that just continued one thing that i will say is that because i was coming back to canada after living in new york for many years that it attracted some of my like my growing up, like like my cult, my musical cultural cult, culture here, and then it's close enough to New York that all the New Yorkers like coming up here to work. So it fused those two things. So that's one of the sounds. Like if you listen to Stevens' record, you know um, everybody's on there. Ginger and Sarah are singing. It's all recorded on the island, and then Tony Shear played some guitar in New York um, with other artists like Corley. It happens more 50, 50 between New David, David Corley. I'm speaking of from Indiana. It's, it's a confluence of the work done in Brooklyn and the work done here. So it's like the only, if it is a club, the only membership it is just that, um, that creative impulse that then, so that, that all just started happening. And then all of a sudden, I think it was Corley who first said to me, man, we should put a name on this because everybody is like referring to that this music's all coming out of the same place. So we really only made the label. It wasn't like, let's make a label and sign some artists. It was like the label had to define what was happening, which was a, a really good idea because it, 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 is, it, is of a, it is of a kind, you know? Um, I remember one time when Broken Social Scene was staying at my place in Brooklyn and Kevin Drew said to me uh, after a show, he's, he was like, man, the thing about it, Brown, is that you're into everything. You're into all of it, you know? And I think we were listening to Arab Apart or something like that at, at, at the time. Um, and it's true. I am into all of it, like all of it. And so it's not genre it's definitely not about a genre focused label it's it's more about just setting the table you know and what 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 happens yeah. two really uh really brief anecdotes to illustrate the wonderful unpredictably uh un unpredictability of recording on wolf island <clears throat> one of them actually involves uh jason mercer Chris's neighbor, who has his own studio, Neptune's Machine. And I, I believe the Gertrudes were recording in there. And of course, there's work going on on the Wolf Island Ferry. 
And during one song, a jackhammer came in and it was so loud. It, it was clearly audible on the recording. And the, the remarkable, the wonderful synchronicity is that the jackhammer was absolutely perfectly in time, exactly like 130 BPM or something. I don't know what it was, but so much that they didn't have to imagine. They didn't have to change it because it fit right in. And, you know, when they, they played uh, that song live uh, a couple of weeks ago at the hotel on the island, and I really missed the jackhammer. Um, <laughs> the other story is uh, that once uh, Bear barked because Chris's cat's Bear, the dog, was sitting at my feet while I tried to sing, uh, barked just because some of the, I think some of the cats were going for their own food and bark, uh, and, and Bear was, you know, indignant about them eating their own food. And so he barked just as we finished the song. And I love the bark, but it didn't fit on that song. So we transposed it to another song, an instrumental, where the bark becomes the final instrumental note on the song. Okay, that's all I want to say. Great the, stories. The other, the other anecdote I would tell about Steven's record was something was happening construction-wise at my house. And, and it was like, okay, we couldn't record at my house because I can't remember what was being worked on. I think somebody was uh, was chopping up a, the wood, was was uh, using a, a bandsaw and some of the big... Uh, your neighbor had got in a quart of wood. And so there... Whatever was it was, the, yeah, we couldn't work at my house. So then it was like, oh, are we going to go to the hotel and, and work where we can record in the piano room or the big room? Or are we going to go next door to Jason Mercer's studio? Or are we going to go to Rocky Roberts' rehearsal studio? It's just like... Pick, pick one. <laughs> on this little island, there were actually five places to record on this block, you know? Music Row. It's really funny. It's, it's funny. And Rocky's got this. Rocky is another, you know, great, um, just, he's a mentor, friend, and, and he spent his life playing music. There's pictures of Rocky at Woodstock, you know, working. Um, and he has a, an awesome garage that's been converted to a, a rehearsal studio up the, up the block. And he's, he's like an elder. I mean, he's worked with, with everybody. And, and, and so that's another important element. Again, it's an international element and it's an extra generational element. And then my godson Cohen is coming up with his like psych rock band and they have a studio on main street and, and he runs a festival every, every, uh, Summer at his dad's farm, which is focused on psych, not exclusively psych rock, but it's like, it's all intergenerational, you know? And, that, and sorry, to, but since we're talking about it, I remember um, Maya who grew up on the island and then went away to university. And then we were at a party together in Toronto. And she said, it was so strange for me having grown up on the island to then suddenly be somewhere where I was only hanging out with people my own age. <laughs> It was extraordinary to me because I'm so used to that, again, that confluence here, which again, I think is very important culturally. We have it in music, we have it in the arts, we have our elders, you know, um, I, 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 you know, that, that picture in Stephen's house of him communing with Al Purdy. It's like, you know, I toured with B.B. King. Like I, he, he would ask me on the bus at night, what do you want to, what do you want to know? You know, and, and we have that in the arts and here it, it, it's, it, it cross pollinates in, in every social circle, you know? Well, let's get into where it cross pollinates with Steve, because Steve, I'm curious to hear more about your story because you've spent your career as a writer, but you've been a musician parallel to that. And you just released your debut album. Tell us about why this was the right time and how that came together and, and working with Chris. Um, yeah, I mean, it's very generous of you to say I, I was, you know, collaterally a musician for years. I hardly ever picked up the guitar. Basically, in my teens and early 20s, I started off wanting to be a songwriter and a musician and playing guitar. And by the way, I had a kind of terrible prog rock band in high school. And the badness of the band can be gauged by the fact that we were called Acropolis and there was an umlaut over not one, but both O's. That's that awesome. Tells you, that tells you everything <laughs> you need to know about the band. Anyway, at a certain point, I came to university here in Queens and I just got obsessed with poetry and then short fiction. And it, it, it was such hard work. It was almost like I put my head down 
you know, trying to learn the craft. And when I looked up again, 30 years had passed. And there I was on the ferry, uh, you know, approaching Chris Brown and said, listen, <clears throat> I've, I've been writing some songs for the last year. Can I play a couple for you? They're probably not very good. Uh, no, I didn't say that. I thought they were good. I just think I thought I didn't have the stuff to deliver them. I didn't have the chops with guitar or voice. And I said, would you listen to them and maybe help me find singers to interpret them? Because I think I'm a good songwriter. Uh, he heard them and said he convinced me that I should try to deliver them myself. Uh, and and in doing so, I became a better musician and singer. But the one other part of the story is that about 10 years ago, uh, I idiotically took up recreational hockey, uh, you know, in midlife, uh, not know, even knowing how to skate. He meant Within... he bravely took up rec recreational hockey. That's what he meant. <laughs> <laughs> Within... Within uh, two weeks, uh, I'd gotten elbowed in the throat in a game. It was probably my fault. I probably ran into someone's elbow. I got a crushed voice box. Uh, it, was, it was a very serious injury. It could have been deadly. I went to the hospital, and the guy said, I already knew I couldn't talk. I couldn't even make a squeak. He said, you can't talk for the next couple of weeks while your voice heals, and you'll never sing. So I like to tell, you know, you know how you sort of... Um, retrospectively make stories a little more neat and elegant. It was more complicated than that. But I think on one level, the loss of my voice for a while was something that made me think I'd always wanted to sing and make an album. It's now or never. Well, now or never turned out to be several, you know, a number of years later, but I did start writing songs again after that point. And then, you know, Chris helped me make an album. Of them. And and you can sing. I mean, this is not a spoken word record, and and you can yell and scream too, according to Chris. Um, <laughs> but uh, but you this must seem like a fairly significant accomplishment, given that just a few years ago you were told that you would never sing. Um, all I can say is that I tried hard, and I had a lot of help. I had help from from Chris every time I recorded with him. He would make suggestions. I had a lot of help from Ginger Ferrand, who sings on the album as well and who knows more about singing. And she emphasized, as a poet, you are really leaning on the consonants because you want to enunciate and make sure everyone understands every word. When you're singing, it's more about the vowels. And that's, you know, I've been listening to singers, uh, loving singers of all kinds. I'm really eclectic, uh, indiscriminate in my taste. I should have known that, but that's the sort of thing you just don't, you don't really notice that people are just holding those vowels and barely touching the consonants. So that was, a kind of revolution for me once I realized that you don't sing the way you talk. Um, anyway, it was a steep learning curve and it was a wonderful experience. I, I, I said, mentioned before being a rookie in midlife is, is kind of an odd thing to do, whether you're a hockey player or an aspiring <laughs> musician. It's also an absolutely wonderful thing. Um, it gives you gray hairs and probably removes some at the same time. <laughs> Well, your, your new album, uh, The Devil's Share, which is out on Wolf Island Records uh, now, um, as of very recently, you've got two singles that uh, have just been released. We'll hope to play one at, later on the podcast as well. Um, but I get the sense that you're a bit of an overachiever, and I'm saying that because, you know, before <laughs> before you decided to put out your debut album, uh, you, you've published 18 books. Your 2016 book, The Waking Comes Late, won you a Governor General's Award. I think your novel, Afterlands, landed on a New York Times uh, editor's choice list uh and and now you you, you produce a, a, a you you put out a, a musical record and um and it's garnering uh praise from the likes of ron sexsmith um and i'm just wondering <laughs> uh it seems like you 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 put a lot of of of, of effort obviously and have a lot of talent um, and put a lot of effort in everything you do but uh how do you feel at having just put out your first album in in um having it garner the kind of acclaim that it's had and, and be received as well as it has? Well, it, it, just as when I was recording the record and crossing over on the ferry to Chris and then crossing back at night afterward, there was a, a feeling of surreality or unreality the whole time. Like, I just thought I can't believe this is happening. Some days that was a good feeling. Some days it was a terrible feeling after a day when I thought I I hadn't done well. Um, but now, for the now that the record's out there and and people are saying nice things about it, that sense of surreality and unreality has in fact deepened. Um, but I also feel really glad that you know, Herman Melville said, "Stay true to the dreams of thy youth," and uh, I'm I'm really happy that I, I came back to this one and and that um, that that Chris helped me. It's a fantastic feeling, and I'm writing new songs. I I want to do it all again. You know, at some point, maybe another year. 
Well, maybe there's, that's there's good. There's something. Go ahead. Uh, no, I was going to say, maybe I was going to throw to the song because we insert the song. But Chris, do you have something you want to add before we get into the well, music? Well, I was going to say there's something to what Stephen just said, which definitely feels like a bit of a trope with the label where there are people on the label who have had other lives who are now having musical lives. Um, David Corley is a great example. He made his first record, I think he was 54. And, um, you know, it ended up getting that, all, all of that amazing press in Europe and took him overseas for the first time in his life. And we were playing for thousands of people, you know, audiences in, in Europe. I mean, it was surreal. Suzanne Jarvie, um, Law Society of Upper Canada, four kids, made a record. Again, like uh, all this stuff opened up. And um, Lara Taubman, you know, who's, who spent her life in art in New York City and Montana. Um, so this is like a thing that's part of the label <laughs> again. And it wasn't intentional. But I would say that like Stephen, you know, what, what he's bringing to it is so much life experience that once you can get off of the anxiety of like, oh, I'm doing this for the first time, it's like, no, this is just like anything else. And if you can kind of bring a, the, you know, a, a, a temperament to it, it's going to be what it is. So, I mean, I, I was always struck, like when we went over to play London, uh, England with, with Suzanne, it's like the audience is packed full of women of her age, right? She, she, you're speaking to, and not exclusively that audience, but it's like, guess what? It's not just about like, oh, how old are you, honey? Because the time's ticking. It's it's not, which, which again, things are allowed to happen. If you're in a strictly artistic and natural frame, that stuff happens and you find an audience. So it's not surprising to me. Like when Stephen came to me and I was like, yeah, sing your own songs, man. Like you, you carry them um with in, with with intention and emotion that was just so obvious and if anything as a producer it was just about that further allowance like i think that i said to steven my my job is to defend your songs from you you know because he'd get all he'd get all over them you know thinking he had to work harder than he did rather than just be you know i mean that's 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 it right well, and I think that comes through. I think there's an authenticity and a sincerity to the music that was produced. And uh, and that may be a good moment to uh, to listen to a song. So we're going to play New Year's song. Yeah, can I, can I set it up, John? Or yeah, of course. Get, get Stephen to, to set it up? Oh, I was going to, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think we're going the same place. Yeah, we are. Yeah. And, but we're all uh, going to the same place. <laughs> <laughs> uh, i'm actually hoping to get some time uh, over the the next few weeks we're obviously recording this before uh, the christmas break here but just to, to sit down with with steven's record and, and give it a proper listen through because uh, I, I i sort of skim through it once to to, to listen to it and I've, I've listened to the singles a few times as well and i love them but um yeah just hope to get that just be able to put some headphones on and 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 relax i'm looking forward to that um, Stephen, your second single from The Devil's Share is titled New Year's Song. It's a song with some layers to it that, you know, I think beckons a few listens at least. Um, themes of awakening and renewal, I think. But we'd love to play it for our listeners. But could you tell us a little bit about it? Well, one thing I, I was going to mention earlier is, uh, you know, I, I said that I, I've worked as a poet and a fiction writer for years and years and then came back to writing songs. It wasn't it wasn't a big shift for me. I, I see song as poetry by other means, or or I could say that that poetry is song by other means. Uh, po a poem is a song um, where the words have to accompany themselves. They have to provide their own musical accompaniment because there there is no you know guitar backing you up or whatever. Uh, similarly with <clears throat> with songs, I feel it's, it's poetry is just taking on a different kind of life. Uh, oddly enough, usually the, the music, a musical phrase or riff comes first and then it has to be translated into words. But this New Year's song is is a case where, uh, and all songwriters love when this happens, I'm sure, where the words and the music just came together as a kind of upwelling, a brimming up in a moment of uh, strong emotional release. Uh, in fact, on uh, New Year's Eve, 
um, in the middle of a very difficult time for the world and difficult time for me personally. Uh, and sometimes those things just come together and there's this kind of um, eruption. Uh, and, and yet it's in a way it's quite a quiet song, but that's that's kind of how it worked. It came very quickly, like in, in um, half an hour, almost all the verses and everything. So just one of those things that I wish it would happen more often, right? You'd, you'd have an album a month if that happened, but it doesn't. That's interesting, and we will get to the song in a second, but um, I'm just interested because this is the first podcast of the new year, and New Year's song was written for the previous new year. How do you see kind of the, the change from then to now? Well, it, I wish you were act, asking that question of an optimist. I'm not. <laughs> uh, I'm kind of a pessimistic person by nature. <clears throat> That's partly why I make art. It's almost like uh, talking back to the void and to the world as it is now. Uh, Chris is a more optimistic person. Does he have something better? Well, now he's how he's sitting in the almost finished hotel, which in years to come is going to host a lot of music. There are going to be a lot of wonderful nights there. So um, that's good. Do you want to... Are you feeling more optimistic about the coming year, Chris? Uh, I don't know. I remember sitting in Rothko's uh, Rothko room at the Tate w w that that has the um, all those Rothko paintings, um, the strata that were, I, I think they were originally done for the Four Seasons in, the, in New York, and they were like, oh, we don't want those. And so it's, it's almost like a cathedral space um, at the Tate Modern, there we walk into the Rothko room, and I remember just weeping and going, "Oh, a nuclear bomb could go off, and none of this would change." Like, literally, that's my answer. So, in terms of pessimism or optimism, I'm like, if people say they feel old, I'm like, talk to a fucking tree, man, you know, <laughs> or or. or or like in terms of like what music is, if, if it is, as we know, if it has this incredible effect on our emotions, then it's operating on a plane that is extemporal, right? And things are shaky, things are contingent. Music's not contingent. We know that, you know? So like in terms of my, what, what would be referred to as my optimism, <laughs> I mean, shit is pretty dire. Like, like I think it sucks. I think human beings are fucking disgusting the way we don't account for ourselves and work out on each other, and myself included, right? So the hope is, and the and and the, the feeling is, is that there are these places where we can reckon with ourselves, right? And and I think especially when times are challenging, look at what's happening right now. People are going and screaming at doctors. <laughs> Why are they screaming at doctors? Because they're terrified. The planet is shaking. They're, the, you know, the economy is shaking. People are, you know, and it's just like, uh, you know, how about something else? How about singing a song? How about writing a song? How about sitting still? You know, I, I just like, Lotus position is is there so you can die sitting up, you know, <laughs> like that's so that's my optimism, <laughs> which which it does really make me happy. Like I feel so like us like talking like this. This is right. Like especially right now, it's just it just it just feels really good. And I and I was saying to my God, one of my Godchildren the other day that like at this time where things are perilous or question question those those things that are real become that much more highlighted you know as much as we have challenges we also know pretty much right now what counts it's yeah. just it's just about being able to have the courage to stay with that so you you, you must be an, an optimist because i feel like I, I feel like during the pandemic, I feel like Kingston has become relatively quiet in terms of its activity, but I feel the opposite has happened on Wolf Island with initiatives like the Wolf Island Commons, the renovations to the Story General Wolf Hotel, which is a longstanding live music venue on the island, which you're sitting in right now. And it's, it's now it's new reopening as the hotel on Wolf Island. I sense like Wolf Island is 
taken the pandemic as an opportunity to revision and reimagine what it wants to be when it grows up. And you, you've kind of been at the center of a lot of these things. I know you're involved in, in many of the initiatives, but can you explain to our listeners what's been happening on Wolf Island? Yeah, so the hotel, let's start from there which uh, for decades has been a, a, a place of, of gathering and music. You know, I started playing piano here, I don't know, 12, 15 years ago, and Mustafa, the previous owner, was like, you should buy the hotel. I was like, no, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's like, you know, knowing it needs to be preserved because if we, Tom Carpenter and I, if we didn't do this, then this would be knockdown condos. Like literally people were coming hard and fast. And especially once we started closing the deal, um, they would do what I would refer to as extractive capitalism. They go, what's that worth? Who can I sell it to for how much? And, uh, you know, who do I get involved to make decisions totally off Island? What we did was created a not-for-profit called the Wolf Island Commons. We t- turned the the pier and, and derelict parking lot into a farmer's market this summer, which helped sustain local growers and artisans through the pandemic and will grow to be a place permanently, a place of civic space, of live venue, ecologically sound park, um, public water access, and, and farmer's market. Um, the hotel itself has been renovated and wired for recording, broadcast, um, it's, it's got two major live rooms in outside. There's a live stage by the patio restaurant. And then the market area I was saying can hold about a thousand people for larger shows. So there's four venues here. Um, there's also areas for workshops, which have been happening virtually everything from the arts, uh, under pandemic to Canadian organic growers, to lodgepole in, you know, indigenous focused work. Um, and then Andrew Dillon, our wonderful new head chef, who's worked everywhere, grew up in Ottawa, the pandemic took him home. We're doing um, as much locally based food as possible, and that will continue and grow as the not-for-profit does it work to support and sustain those growers already here and sustain an economy that can bring new growers here. So things like working on infrastructure on the island to be supportive to the agricultural community. We basically said to the farmers, well, what can we do for you? And they said, build us a market. We did that, you know, and, and now a, a, a few of the producers have said to us, we wouldn't have survived the pandemic if that market hadn't been there. So the nice thing about the arts is that it can bring money to the island and leave it there. It can build, it can build jobs, you know, here certainly at the hotel in the commons, and it can work in communion with agriculture because unlike other forms of capitalism, it doesn't, require land to exploit and extract and flip farms, right? The idea is to create an economy that supports both the arts and agriculture here. So definitely under COVID, it's been both a great challenge and also an opportunity to display something that's more circular, that's less contingent on um, the outside and, and something that can then welcome people uh, we've got the world's biggest electric ferry is about to be docking here come next fall. So I think preparing all these things, I, I always compare it to the way the mangroves um, protect the shoreline from the storm. And once they're gone, what do you have? Hotel chains and and monster homes. It's like if we can create economic marshes and mangroves, then it can absorb the coming people, the growing population and not be part of this extractive, centralized economic premise, right? So that's the basic thing. Like the record company, it wasn't pre- to just naturally, what do you want to do? How do you want to live? What do you do with the day? You know, and, and well, what's in the way of that? Capitalism, capitalism's in the way. Okay, get into capitalism, you know, and, and so, I think the Tom and I have been learning a great deal owning the hotel um, and the idea of making it a, you know, just continuing, I shouldn't say making it, continuing it as a platform for the arts, you know, uh, is, is really, really important. And, you know, those don't really grow off of your standard return on investment measurements that people who would do 
condominium development or whatever, they, banks understand that language. If we say, no, no, we've got a multi-generational plan here to be a cross-sectoral support system for the growth of arts and agriculture nationally and starting with our locality. <laughs> You know, banks don't cut checks for that, but a critical mass forms of, of people internationally who believe in that. So that's what we've done. We have an advisory board from around the world and it's it's hyper, hyper local. So that's that's in a nutshell what's happening in the, in the broad picture. That's that's great. Uh, sorry, I just realized we never played the song, so I'm going to throw to the song now <laughs> oh, <shit. laughs> and get us back on track. <laughs> Yeah, we'll, we'll just throw to the song here and we'll, we'll come back. So this is New Year's Song on Kingston Live by Steve Hyden. Steven, The Devil's Share was your debut album. And as far as debuts go, it's excellent and uh, garnering some attention, as we as we mentioned. But was was this, it sounds like it's not going to be just a one-off artistic experiment for you but you know are there any plans materializing now for uh, for a follow-up at some point i i have about eight songs that i think are more or less done and another five that are in process and, and promising i think some of them still need you know a bridge or or some more development uh some of the lyrics aren't quite there but really i, I almost have enough material already i mean making a record is a lot of work and and you know, so I, I don't know when it's going to happen, but I, I guess I would hope maybe I'd start recording one or two songs in 2023. That's the plan. I definitely want to keep doing it. All I want to do these days is write short stories and songs. Those are the forms I feel called to do. The, the poetic, uh, the impulse to poetry has now just transformed into this songwriting form. And as for the other thing that I did for years to make a living, writing novels, novels are impossible. And I keep promising myself I'm never going to embark on that journey again, though I probably will take another, I may have to take another run at it because as a, as a fiction writer, it's almost the only way to, to bring in much income. <laughs> Steve, you talked earlier uh, briefly about the relationship between lyrics and poetry, and um, I was reading Paul Simon's biography, and there was a quote in there that I want to run by you. I really want to get your reaction. He said, the lyrics of pop songs are so banal that if you show a spark of intelligence, they call you a poet. The people who call you a poet are people who never read poetry. What do you think of that? It's a great line, but you know what? Paul Simon is a poet. Uh, I can say that without, without any reservation. He's being modest by saying that, uh, but his best songs are, are just are poetry. Uh, he might say, no, they're, they're lyrics. They're, they're, they're strong lyrics, and strong lyrics are not poetry. There is certainly some, some crossover, and we could argue about that all day, but... Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, most lyrics are banal, but you know, some of my favorite songs have really banal lyrics. So I'm not prepared to stand on a line and say banal lyrics make a song bad. There's some songs that I just love to sing along happily to. Um, they make me happy. They, you know, they've helped get me through some dark nights and the lyrics are banal. So songs complicated in that sense. You know, there's a whole beautiful spectrum from, you know, the, the Leonard Cohen song, which has the beautiful lyrics that are poetry or the Paul Simon song right down to, you know, someone singing two rye, two rye, two rye, a, you know, or whatever. And that's just nonsense lyrics, right? But it you know, puts a smile on your face, puts a spring into your step on the dance floor. Well said. I like it. Chris, I wanted to come back to uh, Wolf Island Commons and, and some of the, the things that are happening there. You gave us your perspective as someone who's involved in, in the initiatives and and your experience of them and, and the impetus behind them. Uh we are, John and I are mainlanders, maybe most of our listeners are too. I don't know if that's how you refer to us or not, but, uh, you know, I know that thousands and thousands of Kingstonians are tourists to Wolf Island every, every year. And it, it, it's funny because it's, it's a short ferry ride away, but can you explain to us and, and our listeners how the experience of visiting Wolf Island uh, how you're hoping to change that for us. What are the things that we can expect to be different, you know, next year, the year after, and the years ahead as as we continue to visit uh, Wolf Island as we're compelled to do? 
Well, I think that the music will be constant. I know that music will be constant. Um, and it's been constant over here, evinced by, you know, what under the, the um, even under the pandemic, we've made six albums, you know, in the last year and a half. But now that there is a public space for it, you know, this, this, this summer, we were supposed to just have concerts on Saturday afternoons. We ended up having some weeks, it was five nights a week. That's going to grow in earnest, you know, so it will be a place for local and international arts and music events, uh, you know, so that's, that's just already kind of an effect. Um, then I think food events, like we started the Wolf Island Garden Party a few years back, um, which now it's kind of like the hotel is the garden party. There's constant food, local food, you know, um, the, the kitchen's growing um, in a way under Andrew that is, you know, experimenting and, and finding its sweet spot. And, and I know there's been talk about guest chefs. We had uh, curry original over here for a night after it closed, you know? So it'll, it'll also be a ven venue for pop-up situations like that. Um, and then I'd say watching this place and watching people for more than a decade get off that boat wander up and down the highway and get back on that boat because there was no civic waterfront. It's like there's now a public waterfront. The pier has been rebuilt. There's a park being um, constructed. There's the market on Saturdays. Um, there's a place to come to swim, um, to, to commune. And, and, then, and then from that, it's a launch point to the rest of the island to, you know, right next to us, you can rent canoes and kayaks. Um, we're, we're planning the first uh, international film festival out there on the pier beginning this, this summer. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think that all of those things work in communion with the birders, you know, the people who come here to, to enjoy nature and enjoy the water. You know, it's creating civic outlets for that, for, for that so that it's not just private or you like as i said people just kind of strolling main street going where do i go you know there's somewhere to come the, the hotel you know lots of people in the winter too have been coming just to use hang out use the internet have a beer there might be a band recording here you know and they just it's all part of it so i so in a way i think you know we've even talked about formalizing that um when people are running albums in inside the, the hotel of being able to come and eat dinner and, and be part of that the way they are at the post office. So those are some of the things. Um, and then we're also open to ideas and suggestions. So some of the online stuff we've been doing under COVID, as I mentioned, these workshops has, has been about market. People say, I really want wheel, wheelchair accessible docking for the boats, you know? Um, it, the, the way that this place can really serve as a civic asset, both for the people who live here and the visitors, Kingston first and foremost is very important. So coming and engaging, you know, uh, and lots of Kingston artists now are, are, are playing concerts here. Um, so that's what I think can, we, you can see right now, you know, the boat goes to the winter dock. So it's a little, a bit of a trek, a 20 minute walk into the village, but soon that boat will be just be coming right to the village and, meters from the doorstep here so it can really function as um, an outlet artistically and culinary wise for downtown you know yeah it's it seems like you know, the motivation behind this isn't driven out of self-interest you you're, you're listening and uh, and getting input from people and actioning those ideas um but i was wondering what, what is your greatest hope for wolf highland and its inhabitants well, that's a really interesting question. Um, I hope that everybody in their myriad of traditions and pursuits here can be encouraged and given a platform for those things to continue and grow and be sustaining and not be challenged by all of the, the frontier of whether it's a pandemic or rampant capitalism that would crush that stuff. You know, I would, I would hope that all of those farmers can continue growing and being farmers. I would hope that the musicians who come here 
have a place that that they find, like Stephen was mentioning, that's nurturing for them to explore and discover artistic pursuits. I would hope that our kitchen could be um, conducive to supporting, you know, the local economy and, and the local agriculturalists. So that's the present tense. The market certainly happened faster than anybody expected. Tom Carpenter, my partner in the hotel, just sat down right here. Hello. Here he is. Hello, the, Tom. Afore the aforementioned Tom. All right. Welcome to the Kingston Live podcast. <laughs> uh, hi. Hey, yeah. Tom. Good Hello. to see your face, man. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so that's that's in a nut, in a nutshell, like because it's a very interesting question because people's hopes for this place are very different. Some of them are generationally based, some of them are brand new, you know. Um, and and I, I definitely, having lived in cities all my life, it's been a real education to live rurally. It's it's opened my eyes in many ways that you know I just didn't understand, and and never will. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen, I know it's a, things may look pretty bleak for live music here in Kingston and Wolf Island at the moment due to some of the restrictions, but uh, with your new album out, um, will, will you be playing live around town? Uh, will you be performing uh, the new record around town uh, when and if you're able to do that? Yeah, I, I think so, and I hope so. I played a few gigs uh, at the hotel twice and then once at Music Key. Uh, before the lockdown. And then uh, there was Fernie, uh, a, a gig in a distillery, fortunately, so hard liquor was readily available, freshly made and readily available uh, in Fernie, BC, a couple weeks ago, just before um, everything fell apart again. So I felt really lucky to be able to play for, for 90 minutes. And again, that was more time than I played in total up to that point. So I learned a lot in that 90 minutes. And by the end, you know, I started off, uh, that, that's, a, that's a long show, right? I started off feeling nervous. By the time it ended, they pretty much had to pull pull us off the stage um, because it was so much fun by the end and I just want to keep going. So I'm really looking forward to continuing that that feeling, that process uh, when things open up again. And yeah, I hope that's soon. Chris, uh, Kingston boasts an abundance of musical talent. As you know, uh, for artists who may want to at some point in future, when it becomes a possibility again, uh, play live at the hotel on Wolf Island. What's their, their best avenue for, uh, for booking shows and, and getting oh, in yeah. touch? It's super simple. There's, we're, we're all, we're all the major social avenues and our website. So it's Hotel Wolf Island. Instagram, Facebook, or, or the website. And that's also where you can see all the bookings and comings events, as well as any of the food events and menu and whatnot. And then Wolf Island Commons as well, which really, the, you know, the major focus this year was the market. Um, but that, that will also be host to, and, you know, the avenue for which to organize artistic pursuits here as well. So all of those Um, and if you follow them, it's, it would be great um, because then it, it helps us spread the word. Um, but then you'll be aware when, when stuff's going on over here. And Stephen, where can our listeners find and follow you online? Uh, well, the, the album's on Bandcamp and SoundCloud. It's on Spotify. Uh, several of the songs, by the way, in stolen form are now available on um, various streaming sites in, in the former Soviet Union. Uh, <laughs> What they did was they stole the songs off SoundCloud and they munchkined my baritone up to a tenor, auto-tuned it. Though I noticed they didn't. They I have didn't no idea what happened. That. I don't know. I've never. This is my first time hearing this. <laughs> yeah. So for, uh, four of the songs were stolen and they created a little album out of it called Almost Worse, uh, which is a fantastic title for a bad album, right? And it sounds like um, munchkins <laughs> singing or chipmunks. It's absolutely <laughs> hilarious, uh, and I actually tried to deal with the people who stole it, and which is a funny story that I'll tell you some other time. Yeah, um, maybe just go with it. Maybe there's a Russian tour in the future for you, you know? <laughs> no, but the, the tour isn't for me. The tour is for someone named Wayson Davis, who turns out to be a, a high school quarterback, a uh, very promising high school quarterback in Alabama. They just, I guess they just pulled the name off the Internet. So the album is attributed to Wayson Davis. So Wayson may have a tour... Uh, ahead, ahead of him in the former Soviet Union. 
Amazing. Well, Chris, maybe there's a new artist for you to sign. <laughs> You're going to have to auto-tune his voice down, Chris. He's singing way too high. Right. I've already signed him. <laughs> John, I don't know if you have any more wrap-up questions no, or no, anything that's, like that. That's this it. has been so a, we can... a blast uh, hanging out with you guys and chatting. Yeah, you too, guys. Really, really. And, and you know, you could come over here and do a, a podcast from the hotel. Oh, we would love hey, to do that. would that. be yeah. great. Just saying. No, 100%. That would be awesome. Yeah. Um, maybe we can get a few uh, artists uh, uh, from the label to and hang out. Maybe a, maybe a live uh, performance, too. Hey, that would be cool. We're in the Steinway room now. And yeah, like, absolutely. Let's, like, let's plan on it. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Be super fun. We also just, by the by, we, the, there's Cat 5 in all the walls, and we, we've done a couple of broadcasts, even under construction, that are HD, like... There, you can, if you look on my Instagram, actually, you'll find one of me. It's, there's just a song up, but you'll hear the audio quality. It's, I mean, it's the th same thing the TSO uses or at the Vanguard uses in New York. So we can do like actually really broadcast quality music too. If you, I mean, it might be something we could co-present, which would be really interesting, you know? That would be awesome. Yeah, we could totally get behind something like that. We're going to have to re-explore this, yeah, when things start uh, revving up again. Definitely, yeah. Because we've talked about this very thing. We, we've had conversations about doing a podcast performance and, and combining it with a, a live stream kind of thing. So, yeah, we, we, we'll, we'll talk again for sure. Yeah, I think it would be brilliant. Okay, thanks, guys. Yeah, well, let's stay in touch, okay? And uh, yeah, hope to see you over on the island at some point. Stephen, thanks so much. Really looking forward to spending more time with your album over the next few weeks. Thanks a lot, and um, thanks for having me on the show. Great to great to meet both of you, and uh, nice to see you, Chris. Great to see you, Tom. <laughs> yeah, it was really lovely. Yeah, it was our pleasure. It was good to meet you guys. Hopefully, we'll thanks, we'll dude. converse in person at some point. Yeah, thanks so much for the support. For sure. Anytime. Bye. Take care. Bye for now.